What's going on, y'all? This is episode number 12 of the Athlete Factors podcast. I am Kevin Kuhn, your host, and I'm here with my good friend, Dalton Duro. Duro Sher. <laughs> <laughs> it's Wednesday, my dude. Oh, on yeah. Friday. Always, yeah. always. Dalton, uh, how you doing today, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Been, sure. been looking forward to this for a while now, so. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be good. Uh, when, did, uh, when did we meet? When did you start working with me and Ambrose? Oh, boy. So that would have been 2016. Yeah, 2016. October. I was in about October, September 2016. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was two, two years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, almost two and a half, basically. Yeah. So you came on as an intern. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. Uh, then a little newbie out of college. <laughs> decided to stick around and uh so the reason you know you're uh you're on the episode today is so we can talk a little bit about baseball training okay. so if you will give us a uh a brief rundown on your academic and athletic background and just let us know why you're quote unquote competent to discuss this topic for sure for sure <laughs> <laughs> So, so I graduated uh, tw- in 2016 with a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology from University of Maryland. I've had my personal training certification for about three years now. I think I got it around, actually about the same time I started at Modern Fitness, so let's call it September of 2016. Gotcha. Um, it's the majority of my academics. Athletic, ath- Athletics-wise, I've been playing baseball since I was about four. It's been in my family literally my entire life. Both my parents played softball and uh, or college softball and baseball, respectively. So, so I've always been surrounded on. And then, you know, as I as I got into mostly high school, then obviously into college, you know, when I started adding the, the training factor and learning more about kinesiology and the body, I started like kind of incorporating those two uh, together as best that I could on my own, especially in high school. Um, mm-hmm. So I feel like it was much a much newer thing when I was in high school, which would have been around like 2009 to 2012. So. Training was just, in my opinion, just starting to shift away from the classic bench deadlift squat until you throw up every day, especially for baseball in particular. Mm. You're just starting that transition. So especially when I got out of college now and trying to put those pieces together has been more why I would say I'm competent in this. I've been trying to figure out for a couple of years of how to kind of shift that mold a little bit and figure out, you know, what are the appropriate ways the training should happen. Again, not the boot camps of let me go bench <laughs> mid-season as a pitcher until my arm falls off yeah and then before and after do a whole bunch of band external rotation and got to train the rotator cuff so that that was one topic that that i really want to discuss it you know at some point and whether we get to it today or not is is not a big deal but just how um you know i see that everywhere is like everybody's talking about how important it is you know if you're doing any sort of overhead throwing especially you've got to train the rotator cuff of course everybody understands that even if you're not you know a throwing athlete or overhead athlete it's still important to train but the amount of just like oh we'll just train it you know just either sideline with some dumbbells or get the bands and it's like yeah you you have to train it but there are more sport specific or movement specific ways to do that and i think that gets kind of tossed under the bus every I once in a while very or more much than it should yeah yeah it, it seems to me and obviously we will dive into this more because i yeah i could talk about that probably weeks because that's definitely a huge huge soul problem actually with baseball especially younger levels but um you know I, it just seems that too many people th- in my opinion, think that the rotator cuff is the only muscle that's used being thrown. I know it's not true, but that's the way it's approached in training, at least. You know, yeah. oh, you th- like you said, oh, you do anything overhead, your rotator cuff has to be super, super strong. But you know, there's there's so much more to that, especially just anatomically. There's so much more. But on, on top of that, too, you know, it's more than just bands. It's more than just dumbbells. You know, it's all about scapular mobility, not just the rotator cuff. I mean, how many things connect into the scapula? I, could think of a minimum ten off the top of my head, and that's a very small number. So, yeah, you know, probably billions. At, yeah, honestly, if you look at individual fibers. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, okay. if we want to go there on a, on a Wednesday, <laughs> my dude. <laughs> exactly, but that's the thing. Everything is so much more complex yes. than people like to make it out, especially on Instagram. 
with these, oh God, yeah. you know, Instagram coaches. So, um, but yeah, like I'm, I'm glad that some information is getting out there and it's like, yes, that's helpful. That's like a first step. But if you're so focused on like the first step in a race, let's say, then you'll never get to the finish line. So exactly. there has to be, there has to be some progression. There has to be, um, like carry over into the sport and so yeah i think that's that'll be a good good one to dive into definitely in the future i'd like to get a little more in depth with, with oh yeah that. and i want to i want to go on a note we just said talking about the first step in a race and it's something that i i want to try to find some data to back this up but you know there's been a you, you probably see it even as not a baseball person but if you the, the velocity at which people are throwing and hitting for that matter has been I'm sure it's got to be dramatically different than if you're looking back 10, 15 years. However, I have at least noticed from a fan perspective, it seems like injuries also have been much, much, much higher. And it makes me think that people now that now that more appropriate training styles are being um, brought into these programs at, at every level, we're talking like even middle school up to professional, you know, it's so heavily focused on velocity, being stronger, being faster. But now that's only the first step. Now we're getting towards, you know, now after years of this being implemented, where that, that mid-race, you know, getting to the end line where there's nothing to back that up. Like there's no support system to help support those super strong rotator cuffs that people have done 300,000 band reps with <laughs> to throw yeah. 98, you know? Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. that's, that's part of that marathon where now people are finally getting past that first step and now they're like oh what do we do now i can throw yeah. super hard but i can only throw super hard for about a month every year because now i'm back in a doctor's office getting my arm cut into to, to fix for sure yeah it's like we're the the training mechanisms that we've been able to implement and i say we like as the you know sport performance community in general right. i think one of the reasons that there's so many more injuries now but also another reason that we're throwing faster and harder than than we ever have maybe the top end speed maybe isn't necessarily higher than it was 10 15 years ago i don't know i don't but, think so no but the number of people who are throwing at that level is a much higher and b we're getting to that level so much sooner right yes, so yes. kids are so many more kids are throwing faster than they were probably 10 15 years ago because we can train that velocity, especially, you know, especially with the arm. Yes, for and sure. The, I think the biggest issue is not necessarily that we can get to that level, but we're putting a super powerful jet engine onto like, you know, a racing car and then just putting on some crappy brakes. Yep. So it's like, not some yeah. cardboard for the wheels. <laughs> exactly. Like you can accelerate super quickly. Like I see this in track and field quite a bit. We see this in sports where there's like change of direction where everything is always speed, 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 speed. It's acceleration. It's top end speed. But there's very, very little training and focus on deceleration and changing direction. And that's super important because you can have the fastest engine in the world, but if you don't have brakes that can manage all of that speed and allow you to maneuver, then like just... track and field, there's only one event where you just go straight. That's right. the 100 meter dash, right? Yeah. And even then you get to the end, you have to stop. Yeah. So it's stuff like that, that uh, I, I think that's, that's kind of my theory as to why there's more injuries because we're getting these kids able to work that velocity on the front end, but they can't absorb all of that and decelerate all that force on the back end. So oh, no, I totally agree. And what's what's ironic is that you know the whole I'm gonna call it the band academic for lack of a better term with the rotator cuff, you know, constant bands in and out of practice, all that. You know that that started to me as a response to acceleration starting to, to grow, especially with young kids throwing harder, right? But now it's, it, it's, 
it's once again the velocity is caught up now now the bands aren't enough whereas you know if you look back maybe 10 years when kids aren't throwing nearly as hard coming out of high school even the college level you know you could get away with just doing a ton of rotator cuff bands and extra rotation internal mm-hmm. rotation whatever it might be and it was enough to at least prevent a majority of people getting hurt but now it's just everything's so accelerated I mean, nutrition's caught up starting to catch up finally which taken forever yeah um, and then like you said okay. the proper training of power components speed components um Finally, accessing transverse planes, sagittal planes, not just all working frontal. You know, now now there's no deceleration factors to catch up with all that added to it. Um, not on a, not on a general scale. You get the occasional, and this is why you see these phenoms coming out of high school and, co- and college and professional that can last 10 years in a career because they actually are like the diamond in the rough that finds that training that does address that issue. Yeah, and that sticks with it, and that is committed to it and even after that means they're paying out of their own pocket for it they're going to do it right um because they they understand like this is an investment yeah if i invest a little bit of money in this then on the the length of my career will be longer my amount of play will be longer my you know income will be better higher yeah and that's where the vicious cycle of baseball really starts too and that's a whole different subject but you know with the minor leagues and the the very little income that they make once you make that professional level you know some of these kids come out of high school with good families whatnot you know able to pay for the training all that but you get to the minor leagues and you get stuck down there in like the low like the 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 tier system works is you basically start a rookie ball it goes kind of rookie single a double a triple a and then pros now there are like some there are some subcategories within those like there's multiple divisions of rookie ball but for our purposes let's just four categories you know Mm -hmm. you get stuck in single a and rookie ball i mean you're making i mean some kids literally are making less than thirty thousand a year twenty thousand a year even so Mm -hmm. you know there's that's where income plays a big role you know they might have the potential to be this great they might be throwing 102 miles an hour but they're always getting hurt because they can't pay to have the correct training and nutrition and all the stuff to go with it um yeah it's that's a, that's a that's a that's an epidemic that's been happening for a long time in minor league baseball. It's just not it's too much money up at the top and not enough in development down low. Mm-hmm. No, that's that's how that's how track and field is. Like yeah. the the five plus per, well probably less than five percent at the very very top of the elite professional world. Like they're making like Usain Bolt. He's making or he was he was making tons of money. You know, like if you've got that name recognition and i mean obviously he's got the credentials oh yeah um, but yeah <laughs> like, so. yeah you're gonna you're gonna invest in that guy you're gonna put your money there and so that's right. why you know there's i remember shoot maybe 2004 olympics maybe um i can't remember but there was a uh, there was a guy he was a th- uh, thrower did shot put mm-hmm. and he didn't even have a sponsor at the U.S. Olympic trials, he wore a a plain white T-shirt and just in, with a marker wrote on it, "Advertise here." Wow! And and he qualified for the Olympics. He had no financial help. Wow! So, yeah. So even at that level, even at like the pro level in track and field, it's it's, it's rough. So, um, but yeah, like I've been to some minor league baseball games and I've been like, man, these guys must love the game because there's no you're not doing it for the money yeah you, you've got to love it yeah you I mean, you you have to because if not you'll it's the burnout rate is so quick in this minor league system because of that exact reason you know if, mm-hmm. and it's too many times when guys get stuck there because it's it, it kind of reminds me of you know starting a new and just a new job in general whatever that might be you know oh you'll get moved up to you'll be you'll be the gm by the end of the next two years you know kind of that deal <laughs> same thing in baseball like you know they, they take these young kids out of high school sometimes you know not from good backgrounds not from good economic backgrounds what i should say of this promise of oh you're going to be on tv in the next five years making millions and millions of dollars where mm-hmm. it just it's just not always true like it's it's so i mean it's Last time I checked, the statistic was like under one percent. It's like you know points, whatever it might be, four percent of high school baseball players end up making it into the professional league as a whole, and then mm-hmm. from that percentage, it's even smaller that actually go to the pro level itself, like the actual MLB what we see on TV. Yeah, um, dude, I just saw. Uh, I think Eric Cressy may have retweeted it, but it was the total number of people who've ever been on a Major League Baseball roster. 
since the beginning. It was less than 20,000 people. Yeah, right? so it's... 20,000 professional baseball players ever. That would, like, not even fill half of most baseball stadiums. No, not even. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, crazy. It's, it's insane. It's absolutely... Yeah. It, it's just insane. That, that is insane. So... It's, Baseball is also too that I've noticed. I mean, it's it's one of those sports where you can stay in a long time, depending on position. You know, pitchers you don't have nearly as long of a lifespan. I mean, look at a guy like Albert Pujols, who's he's got to be. I think he's getting closer to forty now at this point, and mm-hmm. still going. Like he's still got multiple years on a contract. I mean, he signed like a ten-year deal when he was thirty-four, thirty-five. That's so crazy. You got these guys, yeah, right. So I mean, like you even got these guys who like and now. He's still producing numbers, so it's not as big of a concern for someone like him. I mean, I've seen you see him multiple times, and this happens in most sports too. But you know, you get these older guys who probably aren't as good as their younger counterparts, but you only get X amount of spots on a roster in baseball, and then you've got again those four plus divisions underneath waiting to come filling in too. So you get these older guys stuck in a spot for extra long, maybe not producing the numbers that they used to, but when you're paying them. 20 30 million dollars a year you're putting them in that lineup that's for sure yeah yeah people, just there people pay to see them oh probably. yeah yeah oh yeah which and then it just has like a trickle down effect to those younger kids who are still struggling not just financially but you know physically too to actually get good enough and get even a shot to make it up to the the show as they call it mm-hmm. the big dance oh yeah big dance you said twenty thousand <laughs> ever that's it's small company to say the least. Yeah, it's not a lot. I mean, it's a lot when you think about just that many people. But yeah. to have ever been on an MLB roster like this. Yeah, relatively speaking to the, the grand total of people it's being pulled for from, it's not a lot of people at all. For sure. For sure. So, um, all right. So, you played a little baseball You when you were working with, uh, with us at Modern Fitness. You were kind of, you were working with most of the baseball, softball athletes. So, what uh, what can you tell me as far as like the most important training tenets or factors for baseball and softball athletes? What what are the big ones? What are the big the big rocks? The the big ones to me, and I've been kind of messing around with this philosophy a little more recently too. Even though I'm not training as many baseball athletes now, more just on my personal, um, is one extensor strength, extensor strength, and I'm gonna say elasticity, mostly mobility for our sake, um, and then particularly transverse plane, not just power. It's more the mobility. Um, that's why I notice a lot of, especially working with younger kids. It looks at modern fitness. I mean, my age range is that I was working with tend to be about like nine to high school, so about you know 15 ish, let's call it. Mm-hmm. Um, the the biggest limiting factor that I noticed with that had to have been transverse plane mobility and that's not just like I'm, I'm mostly mean the hip but definitely the shoulder as well um okay like I, going back to what we were talking about earlier is that i think the power is there nowadays that just because training not just with baseball just training in general has gotten so much better in terms of not just benching and deadlifting and squatting mm-hmm. all the days of the week you know mm-hmm. the people are actually starting to do more lateral work they're actually trying to develop the hips at least a little bit um, so I think the power is there. What what still is lacking, and I think in baseball in particular, is the mobility aspect. Because now you get these kids who are super strong, even in even able to rotate extremely high velocities, a lot, a lot of torque. But if you're not mobile enough to allow all that torque to be accessed, um, it's it's not gonna you're not gonna produce, especially hitting in particular. Um, I mean, pitching applies the same thing now. Pitching, in my opinion, you can get away with it a little bit more just because you're not as restricted in terms of the final the final stage of a throw. You know, I mean, you see guys like when they land with their with their plant foot, they, their hips spin all the way around. They end up falling like, you know, four feet off the left side of the mound or the right <laughs> side. You know what I'm saying? So, like, in that sense, you can kind of almost work around that, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Um, because you're not restricted in your range of motion for the end product. Now, whereas hitting is a completely different story. You know, if you're stepping out of the box and you're spinning until you fall, you're not going very far in baseball. So, yeah. <laughs> sorry yeah. for all the kids out there who are doing, you know, dizzy bat in the box in the middle of a game. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're trying to turn baseball into a little ballet action, bro. It, it could. I mean, I would. I would like to see that works. Hybrid Definitely sports. Got me. <laughs> Speaking of hybrid sports, this is totally 
off topic, but did you see that Tampa Bay actually just got uh, approved by the MLB to be a two-city team? No, I did not know that. Yeah, so like they just got permission to be to basically play half their season in Tampa Bay and the other half in Montreal. So it'd be wow. a two home city sports team, which I thought was it's a it's brand new to like basic sports history. Like I've never heard of that yeah. ever. Um, yeah. So it's like a like summer weather, winter weather sort of thing. Pretty pretty much. Like but the, I mean like <laughs> that the baseball starts in, you know, April. Like it's it's a long like, season, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm assuming, like, you know, once we get, once it gets to like around July, August is when they'll probably move to, to Montreal because it won't be as hot as obviously Tampa Bay. Yeah. But the thing is too, like, Tampa Bay has an indoor stadium in Tampa mm. Bay, like it's got the dome, so it doesn't really matter for them. It just is just an interesting new thing that they just approved of. So we'll see how that goes. Wow. But uh, anyways, back to the the real topic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that little tangent. <laughs> no, that's that's interesting. Um, just so you know, I hate baseball. I, I know. I'm just, I think it it uh, it all goes back to when I was in, it was actually before fourth grade, and I, I took a ball to the nose and uh, broke my nose, so. Yeah, yeah. You shout, out, shout out to my brother <laughs> throwing that one. <laughs> so I'm a little bit, what's crazy is I played another year of baseball after that, and then I uh, never played again. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's you're definitely not in uh you're definitely not alone in that one that's that's probably the most common reason i hear people stop playing baseball more honestly it just got hit in the face when they were young or someone launched a bat when they were hitting and <laughs> hit them you know i've heard that one before too it's brutal but that and i i had you know athletic prowess elsewhere but um, yeah seriously like, as fast as you are i'm sure that once you realize that you were i would blame you for switching sports that's for sure yeah, as far as early sports specialization goes, I kind of got – it wasn't that early. I, I didn't start really running until high school. But after that, it was – yeah, that was my lane. So, but, yeah, like I still love training baseball and softball athletes. Like it's still a blast. But as far I, as me personally playing and, and like I don't really follow it, I love going to games though. Like I grew up going to Cincinnati Reds games. and. Oh yeah, and like we would listen, in, we would listen to uh, Cincinnati Reds on the radio. Like my dad would crank that on anytime there was a game, and we'd be listening. Yeah. To so I go to Rangers games every once in a while, but yeah, they are fun. a lot of fun. It's I'll so fun to go, you know. Yeah, that's one of the few, in my opinion, uh, sporting events that like even if you don't necessarily like baseball, like I haven't met very many people that don't like to at least go to the games live, you know. Whereas I can't. I, I just feel like, like you know, football and other sports, like it's not exactly the same. I feel like there are more people that like football but don't necessarily like going to the stadiums per se. But maybe I'm just maybe I'm just biased because I'm a baseball guy. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with ticket prices. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like going to a, a pro football game like here. Oh yeah, especially I here, can't afford here. that. No. Yeah, even if you can, like, you're not getting great seats. Like, it's so far away, you know, with the yeah. masses, especially AT&T is. But. Yeah. I went to a preseason game. Preseason game. Okay. Oh a couple years ago. Three, four years ago. For my birthday. I was, like, close to the very, very top. Uh-huh. And tickets were, like, 100 bucks. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm sure, like, the players looked like ants at that point. No, they looked really good on that giant <laughs> screen that I was yeah. looking straight, like literally I was looking straight at the screen. So like there's no point, like I'd have to like look way, way down to like see the field. So I was just like, oh, okay, I'll just watch here and then oh, yeah. go home and see the exact same thing on my TV. So like, I, haven't, I haven't been to a Cowboys game, but I, when I went to see Metallica play when they were here you know, a couple years ago and it was the same thing. I mean, we were actually in the lowest sitting section that wasn't on the floor but like the stage was on like the 60 the opposite 60 yard line and like it's, it's the same scenario like we found ourselves watching the jumbotron for most of it even though we were like four <laughs> rows from the lowest you can be without being on the floor and it's still so far away so yeah like i can only imagine if you're up at the top trying to look down to watch football yeah i mean the screen is enormous so it's like it's insane it's convenient if you're yeah. sitting up at the top I yeah, like it's oh, even convenient if you're not at the top. Like it's so big. 
Yeah, it's so. that's something I've I've never seen a screen that big. Everyone's always talked about it. I was like, okay, I obviously every stadium has some kind of big jumbotron. And then <laughs> you go there, just like, oh, different man. Yeah, you'll dumb. appreciate this. So I went there for a tour one time, and people somehow got permission. They were playing video games on the big screen. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's right up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that cracked me up. I was like, I bet, I bet that's fun. Just playing it on the big. It's like, it's enormous. It's like the biggest screen I've ever seen. So, um, yeah, we're not really talking baseball at all, are we? That's okay. So- <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll get us back. It's fine. Um, really, really, all I have when you're talking with like the most important factor in terms of training, especially yes. for baseball. Yes. Um, Going back to the hip mobility, you know, again, as a thrower, you can somewhat get away with it just because you're not as restricted in your range, especially at the end product of of a throw. Whereas hitting, like, your feet are planted while you rotate, you rotate your back leg, even though it's more of the rotation of the hip. Squish the bug is dead, people. Squish the bug is no longer a thing. That's a old school baseball term that they used to use of rotate your back foot to, to turn your hips. Mm. Yeah, we don't do that anymore. That's so that's, it's not a good idea to pretend that there's a bug under your foot. Correct. And that's gotcha. literally what was taught. Like when I was young, that's that was the big cue that was given to get your hips to rotate. But gotcha. So what's the causes, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say it just it just causes so many other mechanical flaws in terms of if you're leaning back trying to squish the bug, now you've got mm-hmm. all your weight going backwards rather than forward, and then when you try to translate that into rotational energy, you're going against it. Like it's literally shifting you backwards instead of you want in my opinion, you want all your power going forward into the ball. Into the you you ball. want to yeah. That makes sense to me. So what's a what's a better cue or what's what's a more appropriate way to train that correct swing? You know, if, if if we're talking about cues, it's I've I've struggled with this one for a while. Um, I try to find the one that kind of works for everyone. I guess with any cue you use, even with just training non-baseball athletes. But uh, the best way I describe it that I found success in is think of think of it as a door hinge, right? And your front leg, the the, the leg that's stepping, that's where the hinge starts, and you want your back hip to rotate out and around that forward mm. towards where the pitcher is. Gotcha. Um, now, it's not that clear cut because your front hip does move a little bit. It's not completely locked in place. But mm-hmm. the principle still is that you want to rotate the, the back hip around, around that it. point to allow the torso, to allow the hips to open up, which then for translate into your shoulders pulling through. And then from there, you generate all that rotational power up top as well. And that's for both throwing and for hitting. It doesn't really change. Gotcha. Because it's still a rotation, it's Correct. like if you, you train the movement and then the movement then – carries over into those specific skills. Exactly. Exactly. Nice. nice. That makes sense. So a couple of things that um, that I think about just when I uh, – just planning, planning for a client who likes to – who either plays baseball or softball or who likes to play that um, with some of my older athletes, you know, they like to play – you know, softball during the summer, things like that. So how can I make it so that they're either performing better or at least not putting themselves in as much injury risk? Okay, um, that's a so, great question. Yeah, so a couple of things that I think about, and I'll just throw these out and you tell me if, okay. you know, if I'm on the right track and then expand on any of these, please. Okay. So um, for... Particularly for my clientele base, a lot of them are kind of stuck in a kyphotic position. And since, you know, overhead movement is not just from the shoulder, it is from the scapula, it is from the thoracic spine. I like to work on a lot of thoracic extension and thoracic mobility. Um, and then what's the other big one? I mean, after that, it's pretty much just general training, like general athleticism training. But for for... Baseball, softball athletes, I like to focus on that a ton just because I feel like we're stuck in this, you know, this kind of hunched over position too much anyway. Um, But it's a lot of getting their shoulder blades pulled back and down, getting some scapular retraction and depression. Um, I like the cue, put your shoulder blades in your back pockets. 
Um, but I still use that one myself, courtesy of you. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that one. It's I'm finding now the more I use it, the more I'm like, okay, I, I don't want to keep people stuck there. But for people who are stuck in this position, it's an excellent, you know, counter yeah. position to at least think about. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's just a lot of thoracic extension and rotation, and I find that that tends to take a lot of pressure off the shoulder, off the elbow, off the wrist, and you know, it puts it puts the glenohumeral joint into a much safer position so that it can apply force, it can absorb force it can dynamically stabilize when it needs to so what how how important do you think that is and if it is important what are what are ways that you kind of train along those lines no i think i think you're spot on i mean that's exactly whenever i have any kind of baseball softball client coming in that's pretty much my number one priority is exactly that getting in that thoracic extension letting the shoulder get out of that constant internal rotation state yeah. because you're not and you you touch on this really briefly but not just in the shoulder but i mean the, the big one for baseball is obviously tommy john talking about the ucl and the elbow mm -hmm. uh, i think that plays a, a dramatic role in helping with tommy john because um i don't i haven't really found out a way to link the mechanisms together per se just because it is in your elbow um, it's not directly linked with thoracic extension however i can tell you that seeing people who have who are in a proper more thoracic extension extended state if that if that's actually a term um <laughs> tend to be less injury prone or like i hear of people you know if i'm assessing someone who's post tommy john or someone who is concerning tommy john because they have like a minor tear in their ucl whatever it might be 90% of the time, they're also here mm -hmm. with it. They add the shoulders roll forward. They don't have good thoracic extension. Um, so, I mean, it's – it's. I would try in the same exact way you were just saying, like really getting in that position. And then the nice part is, too, is you, know, you want these kids – like most of the kids want that velocity factor with it, too. So, like things like front squats where we can get not only thoracic extension, but we can also work on – uh, quad strength, work on glute strength, which is going to translate into pow more power too. Mm -hmm. Things like that tend to essentially keep keep the baseball athletes engaged more because, like I said, everyone wants that velocity. Everyone <laughs> wants that velocity. Because I mean, to be honest, nowadays, you know, that's that's your ticket into college. If you can throw hard, if you can hit hard, it used to be, oh, if you had good off speed pitches as a pitcher, you could get in. It's it's still definitely a major role, but nowadays everyone throws so hard that if you're not throwing 92, 93, even 95 now, I mean, you can look at any MLB roster even, and I'd be surprised if they had more than, let's say out of 15-ish pitchers on roster, maybe five of them tops through under 95 nowadays. I mean, wow. it's that crazy how high the velocity has gone up. So, you know, like, like things like that I found at least keep them more engaged and more wanting to train and get better better um, without just thinking it feels more like a rehab type situation does that make sense yep. and great that's for any sport too but you know i did, me being around base that's why i see it obviously the most sure. um, but then you were also spot on too about anything outside the shoulder in my opinion you really are just trained general athleticism because if you look at any other sport football soccer any literally anything that chain of direction is also working that transverse plane too which mm -hmm. i think is the pivotal part of baseball which needs i think it I don't know if it necessarily needs to be emphasized more in baseball. I think that baseball is still behind in that sense of training, so therefore it needs more attention than football and soccer and those sports do now because mm -hmm. I think they are already starting to incorporate that more at all levels, whereas baseball I feel like is still – and you see this all the time at high school level in particular. Like the baseball teams don't usually have a strength and conditioning guy. You usually give them to the football team over the summer. The football coaches go out and do all the conditioning with everyone, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and while they do have similar training tendencies, it's still, it's, I mean, they're obviously very, very different sports. You know, football, you can get away more. I'm using football just for the, this example. You can get away with, you know, more brute power and strength um, through the squatting, the deadlifting, you know, not focusing as much on accessory work, especially the transverse plane. Um, but you can't with baseball. Not anymore, no. You know, back in the days during the steroid era when you got guys like Mark McGuire and, all those dudes, you know, who are just monsters who don't have to have as good mechanics because when you're that big, you can just literally overpower whatever's going on. Mm -hmm. um, 
Now, that's not said to put a knock on their hand-eye coordination or for even their power in the transverse plane, because clearly they can generate a ton of it. But point being is that you're you're right. Like nowadays, training that general athleticism factor for baseball, I think, is crucially as important um, to any other sport. Even though people say baseball players aren't athletes, because you see guys like you know the bigger dudes who are just <laughs> they sit on the couch all day, and I I get it too. I mean, like I totally understand. I can imagine as as an athlete looking at someone like that, I'd be like, "Really, you're getting paid millions to do that?" But <laughs> yeah, when it when it comes to that, like, because I used to have when I was young and stupid. Now I'm just old, older and stupid. But when I was <laughs> when I was young and stupid, I loved discussing that specific topic about how baseball players were not Oh yeah, and I I would this this was my general argument. There are Athletes who play baseball, but not all baseball players are athletes. And now I'm like, that's kind of that's a, that's a pretty stupid, it's a stupid way of thinking about it. I I view certain positions as much more skill base. Oh yeah. And less and less, you know, conditioning or fitness based. But even within the skill, like the skill of pitching. You have to be extremely well conditioned at that skill to do it for, you know, an entire game or most of a game. And then, you know, how many games do you play in a season? It's absolutely insane. So 162 and then it'll be that's that blows my mind. So and, and now as a pitcher, obviously, like you're, right, you're right. usually a typical pitching rotation is usually a five, a five day rotation, sometimes three day, depending on like, you know, injuries and all that. So mm-hmm. you, know, when you think divide 162 by five, you're looking at 30 ish games ish. That's still quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. So. It's usually closer to about 20. Yeah. So I hope my, my opinion is a little more nuanced now. Uh, <laughs> Nowadays, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. no, like, I, there were guys, where, like, when I was in college, when I was running cross-country and track, and we would, you know, we'd pass baseball guys in the hall. I'd, Man, those guys aren't athletes. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it so many times in my life. Like, I, it's, I'm almost <laughs> numb to it now. <laughs> I'm sure all baseball but, players are. But then, like, you know, you check the top ten on SportsCenter, and, like, half of them are these amazing baseball plays. And I'm like, wow, okay, I couldn't do that. There's no way I could ever do that. Like, they, you've got to be fast. You've got to be agile. You've got to be mobile. Like, there, it's there's obvious. My, okay, my opinion was obviously incorrect. Um, but, yeah, it was... It was always fun to make that argument and uh, <laughs> yeah, well, have I mean, discussions just, with people. I'm sure, and especially if you're putting like just the so- social uh, stigma of what an athlete looks like. I 100% agree. Like baseball players do not fit that mold almost at all. Um, <laughs> again, now, nowadays it's a little bit different. But when you're talking about like when you were younger, oh my god, I I, I would totally agree with you. Yeah, honestly, I mean, Babe Ruth didn't exactly look like uh, you know. Yeah, know. that's that's saying it nicely. <laughs> some young, some young rip stud. Let's put it that way. Right. Um, but I mean, like, it was a you know it was a different sport back back in the day. Yeah. And what's scary now is when you're getting guys like you know like Aaron Judge and John Carlos Stan who are six foot seven, two hundred sixty seventy pounds, and they're okay. lean at two sixty seventy. Yeah. Can base those five hundred plus feet? Like that's where now it's starting to get like. Those are insane. Yeah. That is incredible. It wow. really is. It's, <laughs> it's absurd. Yeah. So, what are your uh, what are your predictions right now for the rest of the baseball season? Who who are some of your favorites? Why? What what teams do you like? What? Uh... So, as much as I cannot stand New York Yankees, they are looking real good right now. Mm. Real good. Um, they're, I think they're about 20 games over 500 last time I saw. They're wow. pretty much all over ESPN and all those right now because they just got back. Uh, they actually just got back Aaron Judge off the in, uh, injured list. They got John Carlos Stanton back on the lineup. So they've got pretty much their full lineup in. 
they've really adapted this whole let's just hit a ton of home runs and that's where all our runs are going to come from for the past couple years and this is one of this year particularly i feel like their entire roster feels like that like literally from spot one to nine a lineup it's like home run home run home run home run home run home run or at least the potential to you know it's it's no longer that that mold of oh your lead off hitter is your fastest guy he just gets on base second hitter is your best contact hitter or second best contact hitter you know it's for them particularly it just feels like no matter who's up that pitcher has to be concerned about hitting it out of the park yeah which in my opinion i said this for a couple of years now you know i'm sure you've heard the whole launch angle thing over the past couple of years which i'm not fully on board with that yet it's still a little too new for me to totally buy into um i do agree with getting the, the launch angle of the ball is more important i think where that that philosophy falters is that people are interpreting it as swing up and mm-hmm. that's not what that means that's gotcha. not the launch angle refers to the angle of the ball when it makes contact with the bat and yes obviously you want to increase that a little bit because you want the optimal angle for distance i mean that's with right. anything you're doing right yeah. optimizing physics mm-hmm. um but you know, when you when you've got a whole team that's devoted to hitting the home run, it's dangerous. Um, there's actually Harford Community College up in up in Maryland. I've they followed me on Twitter for a couple of years now, ever since I I basically got into college. Um, and their coach, who is now with, he's with I believe the the Shorebirds, which is a minor league team for the Orioles, the Baltimore Orioles, and he he bought 110 percent into the launch angle. Uh, fad, I'm going to call it. And, I mean, they set conference records for wins. They set conference records for runs, home runs, that, like, you name it, they've pretty much broken those records in the past couple of years. Now, he's not there anymore. This is his first season away, but that was something I've said for years, that if you can get a whole team to buy into this philosophy, mm-hmm. that's dangerous. Because, again, if you have one through nine with a threat to hit the ball in the park at any given time, I mean, think about it. You, you go through a lineup Let's say it's usually three in a nine inning game, probably four times. Let's say four just for sake of even numbers, right? That's 36 total times someone's at the plate. Let's say a, a batting average is about 300, so a third of those guys are going to get a hit, right? So a third of 36 is 12. And then of those 12 hits, how many could, if everyone has a threat to hit a home run, <laughs> you hit four home runs in a game, that's at least four runs, yeah. you know? Yeah, um, and if somebody's on base, like, then perfect. It's just additional, yeah, you know. Exactly. Like it's yeah. baseball is slowly shifting away from this whole let's just produce runs with small ball and let's just hit a ton of home runs. And the Yankees are a great example of it. Now, do they still play small ball? Absolutely. Like they'll still do their bunting. They steal when they need to. Mm-hmm. But when you have the threat of <laughs> that many home runs every single at bat. It's 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 honestly fun to watch. Again, as much of an anti-Yankee fan as I am, it is a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, they've done a really good job. Um, yeah. Home runs are. Yeah, and not to mention home too, runs like, seeds. Yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna say too. It's not to mention even. I mean, financially, I mean, they're making a ton of money right now because they are so much fun to watch. Like you're getting people who are not Yankees fans wanting to watch the games because yeah. you know they're gonna be home runs. You know it's gonna be a big show, big spectacle for you. So why not? Yeah, but uh, it's yeah, al- there. It's almost like the shift uh, in the NBA to like three point. It's, it's spot you on. Know? That's a that's a perfect analogy. That's a perfect analogy. Yeah, because yeah. you still get the guys like the Bucks who lived underneath the basket. Like uh, I could never pronounce his name for the Bucks. Uh, G- Giannis. Mm. Giannis. Ante. I can't. I'm not gonna try. Um, you know, you got guys like him who just dominate the paint still, but half the the rest of the league is just adapted to the three-point shot and if you don't do it you're gonna lose i mean nowadays you pretty much can't i mean the raptors are the the raptors were the closest example of beating it without doing it but they still shot a ton of threes too you know so yeah yeah it doesn't it doesn't hurt you when the other team gets hurt so that's nice (laughs) (laughs) that's for sure that sucks man some of those some of those injuries were hard to yeah i watch I hate I hate to see a finals come uh, any any sport. I hate to see that come down to just you lost your best players. You know, yeah. Yep. I'd I'd rather be you know a a good competitive game with the full roster healthy and intact as opposed to you yep. know super beat down at the end of the season. And yeah, nobody wants to win when their competitor isn't playing their best. No. Like a true athlete doesn't want to win because their competition 
was injured or hurt right. or not not 100%. Like, right. You want to know that you won because on that day, you were absolutely better than your competitors. Oh, best. yeah. So, oh, yeah. But, yeah, other than, the, other than the Yankees, you know, I mean, the Astros are still, I, I never put them out just because they've been unstoppable the past couple of years. Um, my sleeper pick for the year is actually the Minnesota Twins. Mm. Um, they've got a much younger head coach this year, and this isn't really a baseball thing, but it's more like a life thing. He's trying to kind of change the way the whole coach-player relationship works. He's much more, um, I don't want to say lenient, but he's much more of a peer to them as opposed to a coach. He's gotten a lot more gotcha. leeway to do what they want, to, to not be so like, oh, you missed practice, you're running a bunch of bunch of sprints, you know. I mean, you don't see it at the professional level anyways, but it's not that mentality anymore. Um, from what I've read, I've read a few articles on them, and I can't think of the name off the top of my head, um, but they're going to be, they're, they've been doing much better than everyone expected because they don't really have any big names. Um, I know they have, they have, a, they have a few that are definitely better than average for sure, like many names you might, you, you might recognize, but Mm-hmm. They'll they'll be fine. I'm interested to see how how they do towards the end of the season. If they can make a little postseason push. Nice. Yeah, you'll have to keep me posted because I will not be following. <laughs> I've been slacking <laughs> a lot recently. I'm not gonna lie. I've been slacking big time. But I'm gonna I'm gonna start paying attention now. That we're starting to wind down towards. I mean, that's it's about midway through the season, so it's kind of a it's kind of a lull currently. But yeah, it's starting to get important. Yes, yeah, it's just yeah. That's that, that's the thing with baseball. So the seasons are so long. It's not that the it's not that the early games aren't imp- as important, but like as a player, like you have to prepare yourself for literally seven, six, seven months of playing. Like mm-hmm. that is a that is a long mental grind. So like it's not that they don't compete in these early games, but like you're right, it's definitely getting more important now. And you know, once the All Star break hits, and after that, that's when things really kind of tighten down with everyone. Yeah, no messing around. No, no, not at all. Put your game face on. <laughs> <laughs> it's Wednesday, my dudes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So for those of you who don't understand that reference, uh, there's there's this famous dude, this famous video. He's always got, like, swim goggles on. And I wish I could remember his name. With yeah. a Spider-Man outfit. He has a Spider-Man outfit on and <laughs> swim goggles in the mirror. Definitely got to check that out. So it's an old vine. Definitely got to check that out. Look it up. You'll, you'll thank us. Yeah, we uh, we fully adopted that at uh, Modern Fitness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even when it wasn't a Wednesday. Oh yeah, that, that's, that's what we would say. The big clarification point is that it does not have to be Wednesday for it to be Wednesday, my dudes. Yep, that's right. <laughs> but when it was Wednesday. Oh boy. I believe it. For some, for some reason, uh, I was just a little more. I don't know. Goofy. It just, it, it on was Wednesdays. different. Yeah. Wednesdays. It was a good different. Yeah. I love Wednesdays. Oh, yeah. I still do just because of all that. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. So how can how can people find you, follow you, uh, reach out to train with you if, uh, if they're here in Dallas or they're just looking for, uh, for some – some answers to some baseball slash softball questions. Yeah, no, for sure. Probably the easiest way to reach me would be Twitter. I don't honestly post a whole lot, but I'm on it all the time looking at it. So you can always follow me, shoot me a DM, whatever. That's probably the easiest way to reach me. Um, my handle is DJ DeRocher21. So it's DJ D U R O C H E R 21. So yeah, any questions, always feel free to reach out. Like I said, awesome. I always have my phone on me. So I'm, I'm a typical millennial. As you would call me. <laughs> <laughs> so, how how did you get the nickname Duro? That definitely goes to Ambrose, a hundred percent. Ambrose. Oh yeah, he just I just came one day. He said it, and the the best part was is that I swear I had no idea he was talking to me for the first hour of that day because <laughs> it was just out of nowhere, like hey, Duro. Yeah, I just came in one day, and he the first, I think the first time I said it was just kind of casually, like not like trying to get my attention. Like he just said it like in the, in the middle of a sentence, and I had no idea he was saying it to me. I just was doing my own thing, training someone, and he was he was like Duro, and I kind of turned. I was like, oh, me me, <laughs> Duro? Yeah, like is is this Duro? This guy? Yeah. I was like all right. Yeah, dude, that was the exact same thing with me. He started calling me Doc, and I was like, yeah. 
<laughs> Hello? I'm, doc, where are you? I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I want that PhD, but I'm not not one yet. Yeah, right. He was like, no, you're, you, you've got that knowledge. I was like, well, I mean, I don't know about that. but You do. You definitely I'll keep, do. I'll keep learning. So, but yeah, that's hilarious. It's Duck, though, man. Like, oh, as, yeah. as soon as I heard it, I was like, do I call him Dalton or do I call him Duro? Oh, that's what Duro. Anyone associated with Modern Fitness or just Farmerzilla in general calls me yeah. Duro. Duro. Everyone. Yeah, but what's funny is that, like, I've never, that's the one I've never gotten my whole life. Ever. <laughs> like, that's the only one I've never gotten. That's what I was like, wow, I finally got an original one. Yeah. So, what are, what are your other nicknames? You just want me to say the one. <laughs> That's exactly why you prompted that. No, of course the one you want to hear is Dol- Dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most popular one, for sure. I remember. I remember. I was like, "Hey, Piper. Hey, Piper. Call him Dolphin all day today." <laughs> She's like, "Okay." She couldn't even say it the first time without cracking up. Like it took her like three <laughs> minutes to get her breath together because she was laughing so hard. Dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. Uh, Good times. Really so is. that's hilarious. So, uh, would uh, do, do you have like a quote or some sort of extremely important information that you think is uh, is pertinent for everyone to hear? It's, and it can be baseball softball related or it can just be general training related or life in general but um or if you have one for all of those categories that's okay too okay no no i i (laughs) I wish i had a good quote a good quote to say that kind of sounds like everything but uh my my best advice to you know especially young kids most i'm most referring to kids coming into high school baseball and softball players for that matter is um try it try to do a little little research try to learn a little bit on your own as well because I, I know especially as you get into high school you get locked into a, a philosophy and a mentality of I can only do what my coaches tell me now this is for any sport but I again being around based on talking to other people like, I just feel like this is a much more prevalent thing and with a sport that's so so in my opinion training specific as baseball whereas you can't like I said we can't get with the brute training force of squats and left and bench right you have to be more specific in that to really excel at, at baseball mm-hmm. um, and if you get locked in this philosophy of I can only listen to my one coach my one trainer you're, you're gonna limit yourself especially in baseball so if you can go like learn even just part of what we talked about here you know Learning a little bit about anatomy, for example, about the shoulder. Learning what some like professional guys who have long careers do. Don't just look at the guys that throw super hard. Like look at the guys who are able to pitch three, four, five, six, seven years without injury. Mm-hmm. You know, and just at the middle, you can at least start challenging things and like starting to break this mold of of what baseball training is and start to at least shape it a little better to, to help, you know, younger kids coming in after you, just like, you know, what I'm doing now with all the younger kids coming in today. Um, mm-hmm. So it's not exactly a great quote to summarize or anything, and it's very generalized, but you can take it to any sport, you know, just don't be afraid to go try to learn more. Yeah. No, being a student of the sport, whatever your sport is, is extremely important. Yes. So, yeah, yeah if you're if you're not trying to learn more about the sport, then things things are it's hard to, sometimes to progress. Like I had a uh, I had an athlete in here uh, the other day. I think it was actually on Wednesday, and that was one of the things we talked about. Is uh, he's a basketball player, and so I was like, in we were reading some of the quotes up on uh, up on my Einstein poster. Oh, very nice, very nice. And uh, one of them. I can't even, I can't read it from here, but it's basically like, um, learn the rules of the game and then play the game better than anyone else. And so that was just one of the things I was asking. I was like, do you know the game of basketball better than everyone else on, on the court? Maybe with the exception of the ref, but do you know as much as the ref, you know, like, do you know the rules of the game? Um, cause if you know the rules, then you understand how to play the game better. So, yeah, spot on. 
Got to be a student of the sport. Yeah, and like another another good example I see is a lot, you know, training non-athletes, and we're gonna go into nutrition a little bit. Is something like a keto diet. <laughs> I'm sure yeah, you know, I know you love this topic, but you know, like I hear too many times people coming in, you know, trying to get healthier, like, oh, I'm gonna I'm doing the keto diet because everyone says to do that to lose weight, and it's like, it's not wrong. You you can definitely lose weight with it. Is it the most efficient for you? Maybe. Do you understand like the how it works? Most usually no. Some people do. Um, you know, there's, just, there's just more info out there. There's more things that you can look at to expand on that that might not necessarily be the best thing for you. It's just like, again, it relates very much to training. It's just something I, that's something I hear about like basically every day when I go into work is some kind of new fad diet, some kind of new fad workout, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. the, big one, the big one recently with lifting has been, um, I don't know why this is making a comeback, but like the, uh, the behind the neck presses mm. and pulls. I don't know what's been the thing recently. Maybe it's just the location where I'm at, but like that's like seems to be making a trend. I've had people just like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna make some safer options to work the same muscles and much more efficiently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can do that if you have the thoracic extension and mobility and competence to do that. Yeah. But but you have to be able to demonstrate that you can do those things before you should be doing those things loaded. Exactly. And most of the time, I find that people don't meet all the requirements to do that because they're not very common things to train. Like we, we just talked about thoracic extension is a very under under trained tool in baseball. So if it's sports specifically, like general population typically doesn't follow that either, you know, especially thoracic extension of all things. That's one of the biggest epidemics currently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what you were saying about nutrition, like I have I have that conversation pretty often with athletes like, oh, Kevin, should I do this or should I should I eat this way? Well, will this help me lose weight or will this help me gain weight? It might. In fact, it could. But the question shouldn't a, – a better question to ask is, will this allow me to perform optimally while at the same time moving me closer to my desired goal weight? And that's a question that is rarely, if ever, asked. Um, so that's that's the big one that I try to to discuss with my athletes is, um, yeah, like you still have to perform optimally. We still need you to train intensely, even if your goal is to lose weight. So how do we do that? Well, we can't put you in this super significant calorie deficit because now you you don't have fuel in the tank. There's no high intensity fuel. And so you're training in both the weight room on the, on the quarter field and then playing your actual sport is going to take a hit and we can't afford that. So, yeah. so we've got to find this sometimes narrow, sometimes wide window where you can still train optimally, but we're also in a caloric range where we're heading in the right direction. So maybe you're not going to lose you know, half a pound to a pound a week. Maybe it's going to be like two pounds a month. But yeah. if we have, you know, if we've got six months before we need to get you into, you know, serious uh, sport weight or competitive weight and you only need to lose 10 pounds, well, maybe that's a better way to head in that direction than trying to lose 10 pounds in a month because you yeah. can do you can do that. You can lose 10 pounds in a month. And then you've wasted that entire month's worth of training. Yeah. So you're a high school athlete trying to get scholarships to go to college. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's crucial. For you. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you brought this up because, you know, this goes back to what we've talked about with baseball players, not really fitting that mold of looking like an athlete. Well, that's a very big role, especially in high schoolers. I mean, both, both softball and baseball, girl, men and women, you know, trying to fit into that social norm of what your body should look like and all that to mm-hmm. do with the nutrition. But, how do you how do you balance that with trying to maintain fit into that social stigma while also being able to perform at your highest level to prepare you for the future in your sport, you know? And That's being right. as based on softball as we just talked about, you know, tend to not fit that social norm of an athlete's body. You know, that's, I feel like that's a that's a something that is I feel like it's gonna surface soon more, especially mm-hmm. in based on softball. Mm-hmm. Uh, just hasn't yet. Um so, I mean, I've known, I've known people, I've been around it enough, like, I've known people who have that struggle of, you know, yeah, I can hit a ton of home runs because I'm huge, but 
I don't like the way I look. Mm-hmm. And trying to find that medium is just, it's, it's hard, especially in baseball and softball. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. And if looking more like an athlete makes you perform worse, then that's not a good thing. Like, no, <laughs> no, it's not. It's just, yeah. And it's, it's, I, I feel like this is a much easier topic for someone who's in college or in a professional, more closer to a professional level, you know, a little more mature. But you look at these young kids who are, you know, early teens, mid teens. I mean, you know, you got, you're prioritizing your body over a lot of other things. And especially sure. sports is going to definitely, for some kids, it's going to definitely take the plummet unless, unless you've been brought in, like, basically, uh, given the knowledge of, you know, it will change down the road or do it the proper way where you can have best of both worlds. Yes. So we're just not there yet, especially in baseball and softball, at least not that I've seen. Yeah. Well, perhaps things will move that direction. And they, I mean, they, I'm sure they probably are with, with the way things in society are, are moving. I'm sure that's a topic that will, that will hit mainstream sooner that's, rather than later. That's what I think, too. Uh, the, the fact that the training itself has adapted a lot better over these past couple of years, um, I'm hoping the nutritional side will also, especially for younger younger athletes in sports. It's getting there. It's good. just like the training. It just takes time. Yep. Trying to yep. trying to break these like 20, 30 year old habits of everyone is it's tough. It's it's just like breaking any habit you have in training. You know, you you do the same posture sitting at your desk for 20 plus years. It's not going to be a two day. Of we just do some thoracic extension to fix it. You know, you, you're undoing 20 years of work. Now now we're undoing 20 years of work to everyone. To your entire yep. population, yep. it just it'll take time. It does. It, that's it. You've accumulated a lot of time volume in a certain position or with a certain mentality. It takes time to change that for sure. For sure. So, any other uh, any other concluders? No, I think that's all I got. Except for stop doing so many bands. <laughs> <laughs> There are much better options out there. There are much better options out there. Um, awesome. Oh, so uh, before we close this out, so what do you know of some good resources for people to to follow? Do you yourself have any videos or uh, or books that you recommend to help both athletes and parents out? You know, I I don't have any yet that are baseball specific. Um, I'm sure there are more generalized ones out there that will just talk about training and you know proper orientation of the shoulder, or talk about thoracic extension. But I haven't found anything that's that specific on the training aspect of baseball yet. Um, if I do, it'll for sure go up. I'll probably, actually, that'll probably be one thing I do tweet out about. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't tweet very often, but uh, no. And even online too. I mean, you can. There's nothing. There's not a great source of goods. Like you could just. Uh, Again, it's it's too generalized. There's nothing baseball specific yet. I mm-hmm. think we're soon. I think we're getting closer. Um, really, the best source I found is just finding good people on Instagram. Honestly, like just it's a little different for me because I know who I'm looking for. I know like proper training, like who to look for. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's a, my best tool is just going through like even Instagram, finding some like some reputable college coaches. I wouldn't just do some some random person necessarily unless you know them. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, people that run these training facilities, kind of like modern fitness, you know, there are baseball facilities out there. Um, one that I can think off the top of my head is, I believe it's called Prime Sports um, out in Pennsylvania. I followed them for years and years, and they've really done a fantastic job of adapting this exact topic that we're talking about, you know, developing baseball players in the proper planes, learning mm-hmm. how to decelerate your bodies, looking at scapular motion, you know, Fixing that imbalances within that, you know, making sure you don't, you're not winging the scapula, you know, that's, and they're using like, they're, they're introducing the correct technology with it too. Mm-hmm. Um, so like if you could just find those like social media, honestly, this as much as I'm usually against social media has been a great tool for that. If you're looking in the right direction, you, it's just like anything else. Like you can easily find a bunch of nonsense on social media. For sure. Uh, yeah. Just like the, I mean, just <laughs> the internet in general. So yeah. Um, oh, yeah. No, I, so like I said, if, if, if I happen to come across a website, I'll definitely put something out so people can see. Mm-hmm. Um, I just I haven't found anything myself that's that's consistently good. You might get the occasional like article on something, but nothing that's like a page of oh look at all this stuff. You know, here here's some of the shoulder health, yeah. health, blah blah. Yeah, I hear you, man. 
Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. It's always good to catch up with you and share a couple laughs. And uh, Always. Yeah. And thank you for having me. Hey, Dolphin, you're the man. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it was coming. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. I couldn't help myself. So, all right, man. Well, we will have you back on again in the future to, to talk more, uh, probably more baseball, softball stuff, and, uh, yeah, training in general. And, yeah. That'll Sounds good, Doc. Thank you again. Awesome. Hey, thank you. Have a good one. You too.